everybody and welcome back to Glaciers and Glacial Geomorphology. In these next few sessions we're going to be talking about glacier motion, which is going to turn out to be one of the most important topics through this whole module. In the last few sessions we've been talking about mass balance and the transformation of snow into ice. We've talked about the physical properties of glacier ice, including some bits about its atomic structure. And we've talked about polycrystalline ice and the intragranular vein network. So we're now ready to move on and start talking about glacier motion. Now I said that glacier motion is a really important topic and so I'd like you to think back to what I was saying earlier on in the module about building up a map for yourself of how everything hangs together through the module. We're covering lots of different topics and it's important that you can see the connections between them and that you can follow the logical thread of how the module works. So we started talking about glaciers as part of the big global system. And we talked about the hydrological cycle at the grand scale and down at the tiny scale we talked about stable isotopes and how, how those micro characteristics, the chemical characteristics of the ice relate back to that grand global scale system. Gradually we're going to work our way through the module and we're going to end up talking about landforms, landscapes and glacial geomorphology. Along the way we're going to learn a lot about glaciology that's going to inform our understanding of the glacial geomorphology. So as we make our way through there, try to identify where each topic belongs in your own personal map of how things fit together. So when we're talking about glacial hydrology, for example. How does that connect back to the hydrological cycle, isotopes? How does it connect forward to landforms and so on? When we're talking about some particular uh, process or mechanism or when we're talking about the thermal regime, the temperature within glaciers, how does that connect to everything else? And what I'm going to suggest to you at this stage is that right in the middle of this diagram we can put glacier motion or glacier movement. And I'm going to argue that lots of things that we're talking about in the first part of the course feed directly into our understanding of how glaciers move. Our understanding of how glaciers move is going to be connected to lots of important glaciological characteristics such as the thermal regime and such as glacier hydrology and it's going to lead very directly into the processes that create glacial landforms and landscapes. So I'm going to argue for today that glacier motion is right at the heart of our conceptual map of, of, of the module. And if you look back at some old exam papers, you'll see that in previous years I set questions that pretty much put that out there as, as an idea for students to argue for and against. So consider that as we're talking through these next few sessions. Glacier motion belongs right at the heart of any conceptual map of the glacial system. Discuss. So first of all it's important to recognise that ice in glaciers does move and we're not just talking about the position of the margin moving backwards or forwards, we're talking about the ice within the glacier itself actually moving through the glacier from the accumulation zone down glacier into the ablation zone uh, towards, the front, uh, towards the front of the glacier. And the first thing the first thing to get to grips with is the pattern of how that ice flow occurs. And we can think about longitudinal flow, a vertical flow profile and a cross-sectional flow profile. You can read up about these in the literature but I'm just going to talk you through a couple of those in a little bit more detail. So let's think first of all about the longitudinal flow profile and let's think about a mountain glacier or a valley glacier. So you'll recognise my, my starter cartoon, ground surface up into the mountains. And here's our glacier. Here's the accumulation zone, here's the ablation zone, have the equilibrium line in there somewhere. And so we're adding snow onto the surface of the glacier up here in our, in our kind of character, ca characteristic uh, case study model. The characteristics of flow that are important to recognise in this model is that ice which accumulates right at the top of the accumulation zone there is likely to follow a travel path low in the glacier cross-section. It's going to be travelling close to the bed, 
and other things being equal, if it doesn't melt away on, 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 on route or if we don't add in lots of extra material somehow underneath it, in the simple model, that ice that accumulates high in the system is going to travel close to the bed and emerge very close to the snout. By contrast, ice which accumulates, I'll use a different colour, ice which accumulates a little bit lower down in the accumulation zone is going to follow a higher transport path and will eventually emerge or be exposed higher up on the glacier. An ice which falls low in the accumulation zone, close to the equilibrium line, say, that will follow a high level travel path and will emerge again as ice starts melting above it in the, in the ablation zone, will emerge again higher up the glacier. And you can predict for yourself there where the, where the equilibrium line is going to be. It's going to be in there somewhere. So we have this longitudinal flow pattern where if you stand at the edge of the glacier and look at the ice low down, if we ignore the, if we ignore the effects of base ice accumulation that we'll come on to later on, the ice that you're seeing at the foot of the glacier is likely to be the oldest, the farthest travelled ice, ice which has travelled closest to the bed, and ice which has come from the most distant and normally the highest altitude location. So you can begin to predict the characteristics of the ice here based on your knowledge of the flow pattern and therefore your knowledge that it was derived from here. And if you were to traverse up the glacier surface, sampling the ice as you went, what would you be finding in terms of the age and the origin and the source of the ice? You'd be finding progressively ice which was derived from lower and lower down in the accumulation zone, ice which has had progressively shorter and shorter travel distances and therefore is of different ages and has been further uh, from the bed. So there's a very distinctive longitudinal flow pattern there that we can pick up in a glacier. A similar pattern we can draw for an ice sheet example. So here's my characteristic ice sheet cartoon. Remember the vertical scale is usually exaggerated here. Uh, we might be a thousand kilometres across and a couple of uh, kilometres uh, thick. But in the centre of the accumulation zone, we're replicating the situation that's happening here. But instead of all flowing in one direction out towards the front of the glacier, because of the nature of an ice sheet, here we're likely to have a flow pattern that looks a little bit more like that. An ice which accumulates further from the centre of the accumulation zone So, so each side, if you like, of my ice sheet cartoon is behaving a little bit like uh, my, my, my cross-section of the, the valley glacier there. And when you look at the ice sheet as a whole, you see this radial pattern. But again, this divergent pattern from a centre, uh, with ice at the edge of the ice sheet, likely to be ice which is derived from furthest away, have the longest travel time, be the oldest ice, and be derived from the highest, coldest, remotest parts of the interior of the ice sheet. And as you traverse up the surface of the ice, you're accessing gradually less far-travelled, younger ice derived from lower elevations. Now later on we're going to talk about ice cores and reconstructing climate on the basis of ice cores. And even now you might just be beginning to think, well suppose I was to drill an ice core at that location. What ice am I actually getting a record of? Am I getting a time series through what was happening at that location. No, you're actually accessing ice at different depths in your, in your column. You're accessing ice of different ages, obviously, but also ice from different locations with different travel uh, histories, different uh, travel distances and different travel trajectories. So you see straight away there's some interesting ideas that are going to follow, even from the most basic ideas about how glaciers move. I want to say something also about the vertical flow pattern uh, or the cross-sectional flow pattern through, through, through a glacier. And very briefly, the first point to make is simply this. If here's the glacier bed and here's the glacier surface, typically, if you put markers in the ice at different depths, go back after a period of time and see how those markers have moved, you'll see a pattern that looks something like that, where the greatest amount of motion is closer to the surface and that diminishes 
as you approach the bed. So the ice is moving faster at that level and slower at that level. But we need to add quite a lot of detail into that in terms of how that works and, and why that works and what, what some of the implications of that are. So I'm going to explain roughly about three main mechanisms by which ice moves. And we'll look at those in, in, in some detail because they're very important. The first of these is internal deformation or creep, motion within the ice itself. The second is basal sliding or basal slip, movement of the ice across its substrate. And the third one is subglacial deformation because the ice, in some situations, if we have a, defor a potentially deformable substrate, the ice exerts a stress on that substrate and that causes movement within the substrate. And if the substrate is moving, it can carry the ice above it along with it. So those three styles of motion, internal deformation or creep, basal slip or sliding, and subglacial deformation are really important for us to understand. So I'm going to say something about those in a little bit of detail. Let's redraw that diagram just a little bit more neatly. So here's the base of the glacier. Here's a there's the surface of the glacier, which is a little glaciologist up there uh, with a woolly hat uh, for, for some indication of, of scale. Well, this is a very thin glacier for a very big uh, glaciologist. Now, how is this glacier going to move? If we wait for over a portion of time and come back a year, five, ten, a hundred years later, where will that glaciologist have been carried to and how will that movement have been accomplished? Well, the first portion of movement in some glaciers, if the bed is potentially deformable, if we have a soft substrate rather than a rigid substrate, we might get deformation within that substrate underneath the glacier, resulting from the shear stress being imposed on that substrate by the glacier. We're going to come back and talk about shear stress and strain and how that controls movement uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in the next session. Uh, but for now, just assume that there's a shear stress driving some deformation or movement within that substrate. The further you go below the base of the glacier, the less stress the glacier is going to be imparting. And as you get closer and closer to the bed, the more stress is going to be imparted. So we're likely to get a profile of movement, if you like, something like that, where there's a lot of movement in the substrate there, less, less, and less. But in this example, because of the motion of the substrate, we're carrying the glacier forward on top of that deforming substrate by that amount. Now, this is an important point. Everything in the glacier above this ice which is being carried forward is also going to be carried forward on top of it. We call it piggyback style. The glacier is resting layer upon layer upon itself. We're not moving this forward and leaving the ice above it, staying behind, not moving anywhere. Everything that moves down here, the whole lot above gets carried forward. So this motion of the glacier resulting from subglacial deformation is transferred all the way through the column and we're moving the ice that far forward as a, res as a result of subglacial deformation. Now the stress which is being applied to the glacier, the longitudinal stress and the shear stress, is also likely to lead to slipping of the glacier above its substrate and that can occur whether you have a, a, a deformable substrate, you can have additional slip of the ice above that deformable substrate and certainly if you have a rigid substrate then stress can be accommodated by sliding across that interface if there isn't too much resistance, if there's sufficient uh, stress uh, and if there, there, there's some uh, lubrication for example to assist in that movement. So there'll be a certain amount of movement by sliding at the bed, so that was uh, subglacial deformation um, and here we have sliding. It'll vary from glacier to glacier, but let's just sketch in a certain amount of movement here by sliding across the bed. So we'll just carry on that velocity line, if you like, there, and say that we've now moved our glacier to this point by adding in the amount from subglacial deformation and the amount from sliding. Now on top of that, we have an amount related to internal deformation. Now, this is the one we're going to come back and talk about in some detail later on, and I'm going to skip over the details just now and just sketch in a certain amount of movement within the ice which is due to internal deformation, creep, within the glacier. And I'm just going to sketch in 
the final velocity profile. We'll come back and explore why that is looking like that uh, later on in, in, in these sessions. So overall, we have a total amount of movement on the glacier surface, which is accomplished partly by subglacial deformation, partly by sliding of the glacier across its bed, and partly by internal deformation within the ice itself. The relationship or the ratio between these different mechanisms varies a lot between different glaciers. A lot of glaciers don't have any subglacial deformation. If they're resting on a rigid uh, bedrock, then they're not going to have a, a much deformation going on underneath them. Uh, other glaciers, perhaps because they're frozen to the bed, have very little sliding going on. In those glaciers, internal deformation takes up a much more prominent role. In other glaciers that have particular bed conditions, most of the movement can be accomplished either by subglacial deformation or by sliding, and there might be very little internal deformation. So it varies a lot from glacier to glacier. And there'll be some information about that elsewhere in the sessions and in the standard textbook. So what we need to come on to do next is look at how these different mechanisms work. How does internal deformation or creep, how does that work? Why is this profile the way that I've drawn it? How does sliding at the bed of the glacier work? What controls that? What are the driving forces? What are the resisting forces? And how does subglacial deformation work? And we're going to spend some time over the next few sessions exploring those in a little bit uh, more detail.